Oh. Oh, everybody came at once. Hi. <laughs> hmm. Wow. Hello. Aloha. So you might, if you feel like it, taking the time to um, connect with everyone you see here visually. There's three pages right now of beings. different colors and contours and shapes and mm. fabrics, designs. Some of you blend perfectly into your background. Mm. I think I love seeing the morning somewhere, the evening afternoon, <laughs> middle of the night. You can see if it's warm or cold. Well, we hope you had a good week and uh, start sitting. And as you um, start to settle in with your body posture, I'd like to ask you to kind of just get the felt sense of your body posture without the visual image. And without any kind of expectation or agenda, but just kind of Noticing the sensations in your body, the changing sensations. And of course, there's going to be sometimes a visual image of your face or your foot, hand, body. And that's uh, a memory that appears in the present moment. Just a thought that comes and goes. No problem. And then just kind of see if you can just come back to your whole body sitting, just sitting, just being, sitting. And I also would like to ask you to kind of get a sense of um, when you've seen a, a photo, this is a memory, a photo of our earth from space in the daylight. And that memory of the visual image of the land and the ocean and the clouds and the kind of swirling. Energy field that doesn't stay the same for a moment. Our planet. And the beauty of this home planet. And to, if you can and want to kind of go back and forth between that kind of sense of the earth and the water, the air, the fire, 
the snow. There's all these changing forces of the elements. Earth, air, fire, water, coming and going. That we can see visually like we often see our body. But to know that when you come back to your physical sensations in your body without the image, it's similar to the earth without the image of the earth. And if our whole body, just like the whole earth is a lot to connect with and be with it, we can shift to our hands, for example. And it's the sensations are actually very fleeting. We can connect with that fleetingness of change. To receive this amazing gift, the gratitude, the mudita of life itself, the aliveness of our hands and of our planet. Same, same. And you might notice sometimes this incredible care that can happen, kindness, gratitude for just a few seconds of life in our hands. And then that deep equanimity or acceptance of them just as they are. Things are as they are. So you let the sensations emerge just as they are. Newborn, and then they pass. Newborn, and then they pass. Then if you can, noticing that the movement of the breath is so close to our hands, you can put them on your belly like you would, you put your hands on the earth. We feel this connection with earth, soft, hard, smooth, rough. And you might also start noticing the movement of the breath, just coming into your hands and passing. incredible tenderness we can have for life itself. 
how much we need this air on this planet. Our body. What good fortune to be able to receive just the in-breath, the rising movement, just as it happens. And the falling movement, just as it happens. Just like the wind passing through the leaves of a tree. We might notice the attention thinking, it's fine, it's just the stories in the mind that come and go. You always can find the breath moving again, no problem. It's that these nanoseconds of connection with how things are. Noticing that we can intend to bring a tenderness or a quiet abiding with very light, very, very light kindness or care. with whatever sensations appear in our body, moment by moment. Just like we can with our whole planet. The same elements. The water holding, streaming, flowing, or stuck. The earth so soft. Or where our butts are connecting with a cushion or bench, holding us because they're so, so hard. These changing temperatures, cool, warm, cold, hot, this aliveness of our planet, of our body. And wind. all the aspects of movement.
anything that appears, any emotion, thought, body, sensation, sound. We can be kind. We can see clearly. We can leave alone. Connect, but just not fiddle, manipulate. It's letting things be just as they are.
listening and taking in Michelle's instruction this morning. Can you hear me? Can't. Just try again. I, I couldn't hear you very well. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for helping us, Amanda. Yeah. Is that better? I, for me, it is. Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. OK. Do you have a headset, Steve? Or not today. It's in Honolulu. Okay, it's it's actually more clear now. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, I flew over from Honolulu this morning to the Big Island, and uh, I haven't seen a newspaper in six months or so, but there there was one. Uh, in the airplane. And I was reading an interesting article that I couldn't understand much about, but it, it sounded very much like Michelle's instruction. Some of the, the astrophysicists physicist or whoever the author was, was, was saying that there's something like only three ingredients make up all of life. And, um, and so I, I thought it was interesting that Michelle was saying how if we feel the earth element textures, uh, the spectrum of hard, soft, um, granular, silky, and so forth, uh, that, that we feel in our own body is a portal into the textures of the universe, that element connected with the universe and, and so forth with air element vibration and heat element and um, water element cohesion fluidity. The article and the astrophysicist well, wasn't using that language exactly. He was using, using language like the electromagnetic force and, uh, as one of the ingredients. Um, you know, the, the atom and, or the nucleus that is 
um, feel that force and counter forces, and that that is all held by gravity. The entire universe is kind of held by gravity, and um, I don't know how to align that exactly with the four elements we learn about in, in our body, but there are similar results, like it's a cohesion aspect of, of the water element that, that binds all the elements together, that keeps them from falling apart in the same way the astrophysicist in the, in the science article I was reading said, you just take one of those away, the electromagnetic force or you know, counter forces or the nucleus and so forth, uh, our gravity and the atom collapses, but nothing would hold up. And, and so like the elements are figurative. The earth element is, 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 is textures as far as the behavioral manifestation, the felt sense in our body, how we feel reality. We feel a felt sense of touch. That's the earth element. Texture, the variation of texture, extremely soft or uh, intensely hard, and like extreme heat and ex you know extreme cold, and then everything in between. And the air element, um, extreme pressure or firmness uh, versus the subtlest, barely perceptible vibration. You know, so they're just, they're, they're figurative, they're metaphors for behavior that were discovered through meditation in the body. And they seem to align a lot, you know, with the re research going on in quantum physics and whatnot. So it was just, I came to mind as Michelle was leading us through the through the meditation and uh, how how connecting I think she Michelle said just with a nano moment of sensation we touch everything because the the, the the article this morning was using a grain of sand and how that grain of sand no different than the universe, it had the same forces, the electromagnetic force and the counter forces and the gravity that hold it all together. That if, if we really know a grain of force, and a, a, a grain of sand and the forces that keep it a grain of sand so it doesn't just crumble, we understand the universe. Uh, and in our Dhamma language, it's the same with the body. We understand without the air element, the firmness of the air element, we couldn't sit up, we just collapse, we couldn't move, we couldn't walk. That, that's what keeps the, the earth element and the, and the heat element, which is always regulating you know, our systems in balance. And then of course we notice and through meditation, how in and, in and out of balance, the body can feel from a mere thought. You know, a mere thought of joy might send tingling rushes up, up the spine or up the middle of our chest or open up the sternum. Just the connection or interconnectedness between thought, emotion, and physical phenomena. So in the Buddhist psychology, it said that physical phenomena doesn't have the knowing factor. We talk about the intelligence of the body. We're talking about how the bodily element and the play of elements, the ecology of the elements is so intertwined with body consciousness that you can discern what knows and what is a texture, um, but you can't separate it. You can discern what we know as heat or vibration, hardness, and so forth. And, and um, the difference between the knowing of it and the actual heat, the felt sense heat. So when, they, when we're talking, 
when we're said, when it's said to us that we're practicing Dhamma to be able to experience moment to moment the realities. Well, the question would be, well, well what, is, what are the realities and what is the reality? And it's, as we often say, very simply, a reality is a felt sense experience. If we feel a plate of pressure, or if we feel a pinprick, or if we feel a rush of, of generous flowing uh, vibrations running through the body um, and know it, the knowing awareness is there, that's a felt sense reality. We're knowing the truth in that moment. And that has a huge impact on our wisdom. It, 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 it feeds the, the conditions where wisdom arises because we, wisdom is an intellect and we can't force it, we can't intend it, that we can't just make wisdom happen. When we talk that way, we're usually talking about uh, having, a, having wise consideration, considering uh, the benefits and the, and the difficulties in some decision. And we therefore use our intellect and our memory and conditions. Whereas Michelle's guidance was zeroing in on a moment, nano moments, reality, wherein we can intuitively know a felt sense sensation in the body or a felt sense clear emotion that arises uh, like calm, like interest uh, or restlessness or boredom when they arise, uh, clarity and, and confidence when they come up through practice you just can't miss it. Those emotions uh, generally, almost always, if they're strong emotions, have physical correlates too. So we both we know both the physicality of an emotion, our mental mood, as well as the emotion, our mental mood itself. It, it's it's that's what's real. That's what's true. That's what begins to create a kind of dropping of holding on, the habit of clinging to things, a moment of knowing what's true. So the paradox is we can't just have the intention, okay, I'm gonna feel this hardness here or these vibrations here or feel the firmness of the body sitting upright. We can't do it that way. We, we, we can intend to, sit upright, we can intend to relax the entire system. It's critical to see realities. We can't see realities. We can't experience the truth through, through stress, through striving, through desire, clinging desire, just the opposite. We have to be so much, so profoundly at rest to know these realities. And then in those moments, we feel little releases because it's just nothing to attach to. Michelle was saying also, not only do we see the minutia of the, this phenomena, the same phenomena in the body, the same on the, the beaches of the planet, the same on all the planets of the universe, um, there, there is a connection there. There is a, a inseparable cause effect condition even it said in the Buddhist psychology, how a, a strong intentional thought or emotion such as kindness has, has an impact so far reaching, it's unimaginable. We have no idea how a moment of metta might affect the further reaches of the universe, if there is such a thing. <laughs> If it's not just ongoing and multiverses and so forth, you know, and in time and practice, you begin to have a sense of that right here in this body. We begin to have a little sense every once in a while. We see how a thought moment, a fleeting thought, not even an accompanying emotion or mental state, might have an effect, you know, in our somewhere else in the body. 
uh, yesterday I had a class with this healer I see, and um, I never know what we're going to do, you know. Sometimes she has me doing Pilates on a reformer. Sometimes we're kind of moving about and, and letting the spine free itself because it should just be floating, as she says. Sometimes she has me doing deadlifts with weights or bench pressing on this machine. And then she'll, she'll just say, well, hold that right there. And now I want you to kind of move your spine like this. I want you to feel your lats below your shoulder blades and the muscle coming down, you know, on either side of your chest. And, and she said, that, that's what's actually, that's what's actually should be moving, just like a jellyfish. And she so, showed me this jellyfish moving through water magically, you know, just by these little twirls, like these minute little intentional moments and the, and the body kind of twirls. And she had me moving like that without shifting my shoulders, without the shoulders bending forward or without them being stiff, keeping them straight. Yeah, I'm still on the bench press thing, you know? But I never know when and where or how she's gonna have me do something. Uh, and she just sees that maybe I can, I can do it because I'm relaxed. It's like when we're teaching you folks at retreats and whatnot, and, and we might plant a seed just at the right moment, but just drop it, drop trying to do anything, drop worrying about distraction. That there is no distraction, that there's just this moment, whatever it's doing. And then helping you find that innate Dhamma rest that we all have, that we wake up, relaxation that we all have. That, and that's like what the, the jellyfish, it just sort of moves effortlessly through the water, like in, in this subtle and beautiful wiggle. And, and, she, and then she had me up walking that way. So we were walking around the room, kind of wiggling you know, our wings in that way, keeping this sense of a line straight down the center from head to toe, but it's a flexible line. It's, it's not rigid and it's not a thing. It's just like, uh, perhaps it's similar to chi and tai chi. It's like a, a meridian. It's like a center uh, so that everything else does indeed relax around it and, and move accordingly, just according to natural forces and counter forces. And, and, to, and gravity, uh, it sounded precisely like the article I was reading on the airplane flight over here. It, it made me think of you know, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke on this Sunday sit about the teacher Deepama. And then uh, last week, a very old friend of ours, the Western nun, and she's been a nun for decades, uh, called and wanted to, and told us that uh, this senior monk in, in Burma, one of the few senior monks left of that Mahasi, that great Mahasi lineage and Upandita lineage, um, wanted Michelle and I to recount through memory our stories of when we first met Mahasi or the times we met Mahasi or what came up when we met Mahasi. And, uh, and so that's, I've been thinking about that. And so is Michelle. And I was thinking how the, the, first, the first time I met him is when he got this sort of moniker of, being called Mr. Void. Because we, we met him, he wasn't in his home center in Rangoon. He was way up north in Upper Burma in uh, uh, Sukun, I think. A, a Shwebo province, Sukun, I think is, a, is, is his home village. 
and we went way up there, uh, about 12 or 15 of us in a pickup truck. Uh, and Chandra was with us. She was only two and a half years old. And, and as we pulled into the monastic grounds, Mahasi was in the middle of giving a talk. And he just very easily and gracefully, like a maestro, you know, leading a, a symphony, just morphed the talk into just this stream of generosity and kindness and care because everyone, several hundred of the villagers came streaming out of the Dhamma hall and came and cared for us. You know, looked to our needs. We've been driving for hours. We were caked with dirt and sweat and hungry and, and, uh, and they showed us where to bathe and change and, and eat and so forth and are really well taken care of. And then later on, we went in uh, to the, the inner sanctum where Mahasi was sitting. And um, I, I actually never, I never saw him as Mr. Void. I respect those who, who did do and did at that time. I, I just saw him as you know, the most still mountain pool you can imagine. Just unperturbed. And nothing could perturb him. And, you know, we asked about our journey and our, our practices and we asked him questions and whatnot. It's been a few days in his home village in the context of how he had lived nearly all his life. I, I think he was not maybe seven or eight when he first ordained. It's, it's going to often happen to young nuns and monks. They take the lower ordination until they're 20. And at the same time, I felt his uh, stillness. Some years later, at this time, we were only allowed in Burma as tourists for a week. So some years later, I was allowed in Burma, sponsored by a monastery as a monk. And the first thing I did was went and paid my respects to him be because I had taken the lower ordination with Pankhu, Sayadaw, uh, a, a different but similar tradition. And I had planned to take the higher ordination with Mahasi Sayada, which I did. So I, I went to meet him and, and talk about that and describe the ordination under the Bodh bow tree in Bodhgaya with the Tangpulu Sayada. And he asked for you know, any needs, anything I needed, medicines or special foods. And he was just calmly showing care and conversing, being extremely even, you know, there's um, hardly moving anything but his, you know, eyes that look, made direct contact and his very calm and smooth voice you know, and the translation from the Burmese to that. And you know, his, his books surrounded him. And then it was the same way during the ordination a couple of weeks later, just uh, methodically going through the ritual that he had done thousands of times, perhaps over his life, but like he had never done it before. And I felt really different taking this higher ordination, taking off the novice robes. And when I put on the, the fully ordained monk's robes, it didn't feel like cloth, it felt like a protective skin, you know, and immediately I began to feel the, the protective nature of the Dhamma that comes from, from the discipline. In noticing an aspect of Mahasi that seemed different than his reputation 
of Mr. Void are the unperturbability. Twice a month, we would all meet together. It would be very similar to a confession. We would generally uh, chant out any mistakes we might have made intentionally or unintentionally, and someone would be there totally listening, completely present and taking it in. And then the ritual would, would change and I would be the totally present listener and the other monk would, would chant out his, you know, any aberration of the discipline, any mistakes he might've made knowingly or unknowingly. And it was sort of like a then ending in a forgiveness, a forgiveness for our actions skillful and unskillful, and then, you know, corrected through awareness and clear comprehension. And then lay people around would, would serve us juice, you know, and give us any medicines we need. And, and it was packed about that, about that time in the early 80s, there were a few hundred monastics. And uh, so, and, we all fit in this special hall, the Parimoka hall, uh, designed to do this ritual of showing our vulnerability and, and being forgiven for knowingly or unknowingly, you know, um, crossing the discipline in some way that was maybe not so helpful or harmful to ourselves or others go through that and it was quite a beautiful ceremony. And I, I remember at the end of one of these twice a month, full moon and new moon. Um, and so Mahasi was way down in front on the far left. I was way in the back on the far right as one of the newer monks. And as they say, at least a couple, two or three hundred monks are in there. And um, generally real quiet after we do the parimoka part of, of, of confessing, if, if I can use that word, and then listening to someone else's confession with um, an open heart and, and care and kindness. And then it's just serving, being served juice. Um, it's still extraordinarily quiet because not like people then start to converse. But there was an occurrence right at the front where, where all these heavy duty monks, you know, their age, the youngest was probably my teacher Upandita, my meditation teacher at 60. And it went up to like 108. And, um, and Mahasi being the head monk was the, the one furthest in front and to the left. I don't know what the occurrence was, but there was just this kind of low rumble, maybe like elephants make, of the sound of mirth. Like a kind of chuckle that you wouldn't call laughter because, you know, the, the, uh, the, the myth is that arahants, fully enlightened beings don't smile, <laughs> don't show their teeth. <laughs> uh, but it's not true that they don't experience mirth, you know, and, and well-being in that way. It's one of the kinds of joy that carries us along the path without which, you know, would make it more difficult and, and boring and uh, distracting and restless at times. So it gave me such pleasure, you know, this is uh, 40 years ago or something like that now, but I'll just never forget it. I'll never forget how that, that rumbling joy moved to the back of the room. And I, and I looked over and I could see Mahasi's teeth. I don't know if anyone ever saw his teeth before, but it, it must've been a beautiful joke and I don't, I don't know that anyone alive today, like the senior monk who asked Michelle and I to recall what we remember 
upon meeting Sayadaw. I don't, he was probably a much younger monk then, um, and, and I remember him. So I don't know if he was up there or not. It, 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 it is what we mean when we talk about mind like water. In different contexts, mind can be like water when we, when there's a, when we consistently practice mindfulness to the point where the concentration or the, the gathering of the, the collection, the collectedness of the mind uh, eventuates in this sort of mind body unity. It just feels all connected as Michelle was saying in her instructions. And that, that is a kind of stillness, a, a, an inner stillness and an inner joy, not dependent on anything to do with the, with the senses or sense pleasures. It's just a kind of profound ease when we find that ease, very powerful place to practice from. You know, so we do talk about mind like water in that context. And we talk about mind or heart like water um, at various stages of insight where there's equanimity. Equanimity begins right away. Equanimity begins with the first moment of mindfulness. Without the equanimity, there, there couldn't be that mindfulness. And then there, there are places where we start to experience pretty profound insight of the arising and passing of phenomena, like Michelle was talking about, just the, the, uh, the um, um, like the rain pattern on still ocean when we experience that in the body, just little points of sensation that come and disappear so quickly that mindfulness can't even touch it. So we're just, just receptive, we're just still, just open to it. And the, the kind of peace that is uh, deeply rooted in equanimity and this, this quality called sukha, profound comfort or spiritual happiness, non-dependent, not dependent on anything outside of ourselves. That too, it feels like mind with like water. There's so many instances along the path where it, it, it feels so fluid and yet so strong, you know? Water is strong and so soft at the same time and so gathered together, you know, and so unified that it just makes total sense. That experience often has people feeling like the taste of home, both in Vipassana and Brahma Viharas as well. You can have the same experience with the Brahma Viharas. And when we have that experience, we learn how there's nothing external to our practice. Like the, among the most important things in practicing metta, for example, is working with and understanding the dependent or attached love. To understand all those forms of love, we have them, we live them, and we practice them by having them and engaging them in the things that we're, we feel some attachment to. The, the metta is, is creating a larger context and space within which you can have these um, sort of little household-like attachments without it becoming that dangerous sort of insatiable craving and clinging attachment. So in the context of practicing metta, metta, we also want to work with what's called the near and far enemies, understand, understand attached love or love where we expect something in return, or we expect a reward, or we, there's just any kind of expectation or dependence or condition. It's called unconditional love because a nano moment of metta is indeed un, completely unconditional. And that feels like a mind of water, a heart of water. That feels 
like perfect home. And it goes through all the Brahma Viharas, compassion and empathetic joy, uh, of course, equanimity itself, uh, with the, which has the most wisdom to practice being and working with understanding, uh, not demonizing and not uh, struggling with the near and far enemy. Attached love are the opposite in our anger or even our deep um, buried ancient rage. Uh, and the same with cruelty, to, to understand the difference between the beautifully pleasant feeling tone, sensation of compassion versus when it slides into grief or sorrow, where there's some attachment, stickiness there. It's not completely unconditional. It's not completely that fearless compassion that's willing to be wherever there's pain or suffering, any kind of dukkha, any kind of distress, uh, showing up for that. We're able to do that because we understand the difference between that pure, profoundly uh, pleasant feeling toned care and when there's grief, when there's sorrow, when there's stickiness, when there's sadness, which are other emotions to work with and understand. But here we're, we're, we're understanding and working with them in the context of purifying the compassion. And we do the same with the, the mudita, uh, the kind of enthralled joyousness we might feel at sometimes, but there's a hook to it. There's some self uh, referencing or identification, attachment with, with it. It's not that completely unconditional, empathetic delight and joy in, in happiness that we experience or goodness that we experience in life in ourselves or other beings. That's what I, those are my thoughts of today. I, um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be staying in, in a place that my best friend in life, I've known for over 50 years, um, uh, arranged for me to, to come and spend some time here. I've, I've done this before. Um, but it's gone through a bunch of renovations, so there's new things. And, and John, who lives on Vancouver Island, he called to try and get me to know, learn how to work things. Like next to the bed, there's a, a little round thing. And I said, oh, is that a phone charger? And he said, no, that, that's Alexa. And you just tell her to play a song and she will. You tell her to turn on the fan and she will. Well, the fan is way too high. It's been blowing my nose all over the room. Um, and, and I was trying to understand it and there was, the speaker was open. So as John was talking and, and using, saying Alexa, like he said, oh, you, like you can take a half hour nap now before your afternoon session. And, just tell Alexa to wake you up in 30 minutes. So that was like an hour ago. So the alarm went off when I was just lying down to rest <laughs> because it, it set off, you know, and he, all, everything he said, Alexa responded in some way or another. I don't, I don't know what will happen when I go downstairs. The refrigerator door will probably be open. And rice will be cooking. Songs will be playing. And kind of within it all, I'll just be thinking of Mahasi's imperturbable still mind and little ripples of mirth on the surface of that still water. So the the uh, intention here, intention here is to kind of mirror uh, Michelle's instructions and how to move into our own bodies. And take that step deeper into 
the impersonal nature of all things by equating everything we experience in the body with everything that's within the universe. And, and, and that way, we see it more impersonally without the identification and without the attachment. And, and, then, and then I thought of this still pool, and I thought of our conversation with uh, Ma Vajira last, earlier in the week in our, in our job of recollecting what we remember of Mahasi. So that's my recollection of Mahasi that stays with me. But do you have, did you hear all that, Alexa? She said yes. Anything you re want to remember or recount about Mahasi, Michelle? or anything you have to say at all. So, I, I think that um, there was a kind of quiet to Mahasi Sayadaw that um, was so vast and so palpable, uh, but I think it scared some people that it, it was such a, um, I, I have a, you know, I don't think there's any comparison I could give, but maybe if you um, went to outer space afar <laughs> and it was just no light, just um, perfect, immense, silent darkness. I mean, I don't think the universe is supposed to be that quiet. <laughs> so it's not a good metaphor, but like the bottom of the ocean or something very vast and quiet, like Steve said, there's uh, an imperturbability, but it really felt um, palpable and vast. Um, you know, so I think actually, you know, stories about Mahasi aren't like um, watching a Disney movie, you know what I mean? They're, they're not they're, they're like Steve said, like this kind of energy of mirth that was so actually sublime is, um, it's hard to convey through words sometimes, I think, uh, the felt sense of, of Mahasi. So um, I could tell a story around it. Um, when he, he, I first met him, in 1979, he, he came to um, Insight Meditation Society uh, for three weeks with, with a number of teachers that some of you might know, Usi Lananda and Ujjataka. These were great sayadows in themselves. There were, I think, five or six, um, and they stayed at this house across the street. Um, and it, these are the old days, the early, the early days, so it's hard to describe. We had four kicks cooks and we weren't allowed to ask for any more help so we had four people and they let in 140 yogis we usually had the most 85 so there were four cooks for them and then there was Mahasi and his helper and uh I think six say other say it though so it was kind of um overwhelming and so there was really uh someone was asked, well, can somebody help cook for Mahasi as well as cook for the yogis? And I was the type that said, okay, I'll do it. And I'd never um, been to Asia to practice. I'd only done one two-week retreat before that. This, uh, So um, I didn't know, this might be a bit of a funny story, but I didn't know that any dress code or about even about really quiet, you know? And on top of everything that was going on then, um, there weren't enough rooms even for yogis. I remember Ramdas came. I think I gave my room to Ramdas, but there just weren't even enough rooms. So I was in a tent in the forest. Um, <clears throat> it was a really hard uh, work for three weeks, but I would get up at two o'clock and, um, I would put on this only, only I didn't have much. Like I had this sleeveless dress, a sleeveless dress, and it went up 
just above my knees. That's all I had. And I would put on my dress and <laughs> I would literally go running down to this place. And I, I don't know if you can imagine like um, what a different kind of kind of inner place I was in compared to these people, the monks down at this place. But I like was, it was like I was jogging at the top of my pace. So like I was young, I was just running down there to get there on time to start cooking <laughs> with Mahasi's assistant. Um, and I would get to the driveway and I would feel like I hit this um, massive wall of silence. And it felt like somebody gave me an injection, like an elephant tranquilizer, you know, and you know, you, you can tell what type I am, an elephant tranquilizer, right? I mean, it was just like, I would just stop dead in my tracks and I'd be like, Whoa. you know, just like go through this transformation of just, wow, just, just having to just shift totally into this other massively different energetic system. <laughs> it's sort of, okay, we'll go, you know, I, again, this was very foreign to me and, uh, go in there and um, the copy, it turned out Upandita told me later, he was a meditation master and uh, as well, uh, who knew. And um, he would teach me how to do everything very slowly, very carefully, very quietly. And one morning uh, I was cooking the rice and I I really burnt my hand. Like I just burnt my hand and this place, Again, there's all these people in this place. It, you could hear a pin drop all the time. It was that quiet. And I went, ow. <laughs> it, was, it was like somebody screamed, you know, bloody murder. It was so intense. And he kind of took my hand and he held it. And he said, burning. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> ow. You know, and he's like, no, 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 no burning just he was teaching me how to make a soft mental note burning and to, it's like it wasn't through words because he didn't speak much English but it was like he really helped me to see that I could just totally be with those sensations and it was totally okay you know and um, that's like how it was kind of every moment being in that atmosphere like I I would be there from like 2 15 to 30 to when I would have to go cook at the other place uh all day but I sometimes if I didn't have breakfast over there I'd make it I wouldn't have to leave till eight or nine but um I had three weeks of that uh initiation into uh, it's like an ocean of a different way of being. It, it wasn't, it didn't mean, you know, people will think that quiet means dead, but it was very alive. Like I felt like every action I took had ripples through the universe. It was that powerful and quiet. Uh, but, you know, there isn't much else to say about it other than for me, it was so inspiring like I just have to say I felt so inspired to, to just know I had a short life and that I um, knew that that kind of peace was possible and wanted that to be an energy field that I could um access and bring more and more into the world you know i think that that's the effect of it was inspiration yeah that's my story <laughs> oh but the most important part is that you're not supposed to wear that what i was wearing was so not okay like it's so you're not even supposed to show your shoulders or your legs like in a for three weeks no, none of them said anything to me. And I didn't even know. See, the worst part is that I didn't even know for three weeks. And then somebody told me the day after they left that that was so awful and wrong and bad. And, you know, and I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? Like, nobody told me. But I just think it's also really cool 
<laughs> that they just um I think they just appreciated my um uh, willingness to enter into a world I'd never been in before and to try to learn, you know, and I think they didn't, they didn't act like it was any problem, you know, it was, it's kind of funny. <laughs> I think they really appreciated the <laughs> immense good karma. Yeah, of, it was good of, karma. Of serving Mahasi. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely. So that, that what you were wearing was way down the list in their <laughs> in their worries and concerns. Oh boy. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? If you have a question, you're welcome to raise your hand on Zoom and I can help you unmute if you need any assistance. That vast sea of silence is available every nanosecond for us. That's the good news. <laughs> So I was curious, did you have a chance to sit uh, at that time, Michelle? 140 yogis that needed food plus Mahasi and all those monks. Um, I went to the Dhamma talks, mm. which is a whole other story. <laughs> 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 so did, you, did you fall asleep at the Dharma talk? No. And they had to translate the Dharma talk, right? Yes. I forget who was translating then. It wasn't a mere tongue. Yeah. I sat so, with Mahasi a number of times at the at the main Rangoon Center, and uh, one time I went in to sit, and mostly they were following one hour sit, one hour walk, but sometimes the, a monk would or a lay person would be in training, so maybe they'd sit a little longer. So I noticed after the hour that a number, uh, you know, people left a little more slowly and Mahasi was still up on the stage. And so I kept sitting and I kept sitting and I kept sitting. An hour went by, two hours went by, two and a half hours went by. And I looked at Mahasi and he, he was as still as a statue. And, and I thought, you know, oh, this is funny. Isn't, isn't that enough? And isn't it time to get up? I'm, I'm getting back pain and shoulder pain and mind pain and you know so finally I just looked a little closer stared at him a while and I saw that I got, he, he was sitting so still that it looked like he was sweating but actually it, it was because it was a wax statue <laughs> <laughs> Right next to where he usually sits when he comes in to sit there. <laughs> wow. And so, what was Mahasi Dhamma talk about? 
the four conditions of mindfulness? Everything. Mm -hmm. he, he spoke of everything. He spoke of the six sense door consciousness practice. He spoke a lot of Vedana and how that's a portal to liberation. When we know the difference between pleasant and attachment and unpleasant and aversion. And he, he would get into the intricacies of everything, talk about how to unravel, untangle the tangle. Very intricate, uh, sophisticated Burmese speaker. And that's why he chose Upandita. He gave Upandita his robes before he passed away, indicating he thought Upandita was the right person because he too had a very uh, intriguing and intricate way of explaining the Dhamma to people and that his main focus was meditation, not running a, re a meditation center. I, I, I remember something that he said that inspired me um, in a Dhamma talk that he, I, I'm pretty sure he would have been talking about pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, but I, I wasn't that familiar with any of that yet. But he said that um, whenever you decide to get up from sitting, that you should ask yourself, why am I getting up? That's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it was really helpful. Or like when you're getting up from lying down or getting, you know, when you're, when you're moving from the, in the force st standing, you know, sitting, walking, whenever you uh, decide to do something else, like, why are you doing it? Like, but particularly when you're sitting, like, why are you getting up? And, um, it was very helpful for me to see that usually I was getting up because something was unpleasant and I didn't want to be with it anymore. <laughs> I mean, that was sort of the generalization. I mean, I have a much more sophisticated understanding of motivation and um, that, you know, Upandita taught me to get up when it was skillful and appropriate. But at the time, it was such a revelation to like go, oh, <laughs> I'm getting up because my butt hurts or like, you know, I'm angry or, you know, like I can't be with it. It really was helpful. Um, very, why get up? It's good. What, what stuck with me was Mahasi saying that Vipassana, Vipassana practice is liberation through love and understanding. Oh, so he taught uh, the Brahma Viharas too? Indeed he did. He taught uh, mm. Brahma Viharas as a jhana practice, as a uh, temporary complementary practice to Vipassana when things are difficult. Uh, every which way he spoke, as did Sayada Upandita, all the ways you can practice and intertwine Brahma Viharas with Vipassana. I still remember when you were practicing with Sayada Upandita and, after, and he wanted you to practice the Brahma Vihara. He want, you wanted to tell Sayada Upandita that you just want to stick with Vipassana. And he wouldn't let me. <laughs> he said I had to learn the Brahma Viharas. But another time, I, I came to a, a long retreat and, and I, I couldn't get the Brahma Vihara stream flowing. Just my mind would get fuzzy. And so that time he said to me that the, your, your native inclination to Vipassana, to liberation practice is stronger than the Brahma Viharas at this time. So do that. Let, let go of the Brahma Viharas. He was just so on about seeing where someone is in their practice, listening carefully, and tried, 
trying to guide them in, in the steps and in the gait and in the rhythm that they were in. So he's not like um, rigid. It can be flexible. Flexibility is a good, a very good practice tool. Mm -hmm. And I also remember you, one of the story about Mahasi Sayadaw, like they were supposed to reach some place, but then the car broke down and Sayadaw uh, and Mahasi and the, just like take out the teacup, they just set the out by the side of the road and, and trying to be sitting, not in a hurry, while well, the driver like, tried to fix. For like 16 hours. <laughs> Except it wasn't Mahasi. Oh. It, was, it was Mahasi's teacher. Oh. The, Ming Gun, the Ming Gun side off. Hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> there we have a hardcore teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Sixteen hours. Just enjoying the elements, or observing them, whether they were pleasant or not. They're true. They're real. They're felt experience, and that's our that's our task. I have a pretty funny story about Sayado Upandita. If, I mean, and Coda to balance things because it's it's pretty funny. But I, I, if anyone has any questions, I won't. But um, if not, uh, my first three month retreat with him, um, he was not having me sleep a lot, and uh, I was kind of gung ho. I my I was striving too much to put it mildly but I was didn't know that and uh, I had a yogi job of cleaning this bathroom the big huge bathroom upstairs there at IMS and Sayada Upandita was staying right down the hall very close to the bathroom and I decided well you know there was a time where you did your yogi jobs but I decided <laughs> I decided that I wanted to practice during yogi job time um, and I decided to clean that bathroom at 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night because I <laughs> was awake and I thought I'm tired then I'll, I'll be able to practice more in the morning and um, I, I would guess I was probably not doing it very quietly like I you know it was a big bathroom and you had to wash the floor and the bath you know the, the toilet and then there was a huge bathtub and I was probably you know kind of making a lot of noise and I didn't even think about like that Sayada Upandita was trying to rest, right? And so after about oh, too long, again, he waited a long time. One day I, I was sort of halfway through and I saw him like standing at the doorway, just looking at me. And he didn't say, he never said anything. He just was looking at me like, it was a look like kind of bewildered, like, you know, why are you like cleaning the bathroom at like midnight? You know, it was so cool. And I went, I was, I, he just caught me. I was like, oh, yeah, say it out. <laughs> really sorry. And I didn't clean the bathroom anymore at uh, midnight. But I think it's another example of like the thing I was wearing that dress. It's like he didn't, he didn't say anything, but um, it was time to stop. You know, he just stood there. I think actually he, he kind of giggled, you know, he kind of laughed because it was pretty funny. <laughs> he got his point out across without saying anything. <laughs> Bill. Um, yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the reflections tonight and the talk, Stephen, they're very inspiring to hear these old stories. Um, my question is kind of about today in Burma and the Mahasi lineage. And are there a younger generation? I know that I know that you were speaking of a, a very old teacher who asked you to 
bring these reflections. And I'm wondering about the the lineage now and younger teachers and maybe younger Sayadas that are continuing the lineage. If you can say something about that. Yeah, the younger Sayadas now are the old ones. <laughs> They they used to be young, <laughs> but but now they're older, and, and that's why they they're taking care of recording everything anyone remembers about Mahasi, and they're working hard to train the next generation. So a, a lot of them, like the the person who's putting together all these um, stories about Mahasi, was one of uh, Jake Davis's teachers in 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 Pali, in the study of Pali and uh, understanding the, the Dharma lineage in that way. Uh, and, and he's he's a very deep person. When he walks by you, you feel his wake of peace. And, and at the same time, he's very light. When he talks, you know, he's, he has a humor. He has that mirth vibe. He has that mirth. So he's really at ease. And my sense is, is as, as long as there's as long as there's great teachers left, a few of them, even though there's a few now, then it's a good thing. And maybe that's what's going on uh, while Burma is suffering so much on the surface. You know, under, underneath the you know the Dhamma somehow has survived. 2,600 years of wars in India and Sri Lanka and across Southeast Asia. There have been so many ups and downs and it's, it's persevered. So I, I, I still feel, I feel, I still feel that there's a lot of hope. Yeah, in, to answer your question precisely, will the lineage be okay? I think the lineage will take care of itself. Dhamma protects itself and protects those who protect the Dhamma. Thank you. When, um, when we first, when I first came to uh, Chazwa Monastery up in Northern Burma to, to be with Sayadaw Ulakana and um, Again, it was another big jump for me uh, to be there. And he uh, talked about how, I, th I don't know, Steve, it, if it was his teacher or his teacher's teacher, but they, their teachers who were dead um, told Sayadaw Ulakana they, that we were coming, <laughs> that people like us were coming and that they had to take care of it. Like he there was a whole different feeling of like when you came to the monastery, like that um, they would they would always take such good care of us, all the yogis that come. But also there was an extra feeling of like, oh, they actually were told to take care of us by their teachers too. Like that there's a kind of karma of um, the the dhamma um, coming all over to all over the world. And there's a Sayadaw who teaches there now with us that he teaches in Singapore. He's a great, he lives in Singapore. He's a great Sayadaw. There's lots of that. Penang. Yeah, Penang. Sorry, Penang. Yeah, there's just, there's, um, I think that they did a good job at making sure there were enough great teachers outside of Burma and still inside of Burma, you know, that um, we're very fortunate for that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Important question. There's a great nun, Ma Kamala, that teaches with us as well. You know, there's nuns as well, not just monks. So important to remember that uh, she's so incredible. And um, I try to text her once a week to make sure she's OK. It's been very, very hard, but I, she's still okay. Um, 
I can maybe offer one more thing before we stop, which is when Deepama, uh, when I was taking care of her, I lived in Northern Maine and had come down from there. And uh, I was trying to decide whether to come and move near the meditation center. And uh, I asked her what I should do and she just laughed. And she just said, oh, the Dhamma is everywhere. And I think it's very important for us to remember that, that the Dhamma is everywhere and we don't have to go anywhere except inside of us to find it, you know. She said it very joy, joy, joyfully, like just so joyfully. The Dhamma is everywhere. And then I moved anyway. <laughs> I wanted to be closer to people that were practicing, but I knew I would be okay if I had it. I did. Whether or not there are Buddhas, the Dhamma is We wish you all to have a wonderful week ahead and look forward to seeing all your shining faces and bright eyes and colorful backgrounds next week. Try to practice both love and understanding. That's time Vipassana. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you, Amanda, again for helping. Thank you. Mm -hmm.